Hello friends, welcome back to this series on quantum mechanics. Let's pick up where we left off last time and continue with our discussion of the states of a particle moving in a central potential. The energy eigenfunctions psi of such a particle satisfy the following eigenfunction equation. Here, we have denote the mass of the particle by mu to avoid confusion with the magnetic quantum number m. Because psi is also the eigenfunction of the third component of angular momentum due to the spherical symmetry of the Hamiltonian. This equation is separable as we have shown in lecture 10. Here's a quick review. Here we plug in psi, which is separated between the radial and angular coordinates. The function y is chosen to be the eigenfunction of L square. Both depend only on the angular variables. The equation in the blue box defines the spherical harmonics. The function y then simply drops out. And we end up with two equations separated between the radial and angular variables. We have spent a considerable amount of time solving the angular equation in the last few lectures. This equation is independent of the potential v and simply says that the state psi has a definite angular momentum. Now we shall tackle the radial equation, which actually characterizes the energy of the particle. This equation looks very similar to the Schrodinger's equation describing a particle moving in one-dimensional space. Let's see if we can make some transformations on the radial function to complete this analogy. We can get some clues from how the 3D wave function psi is normalized. By convention, we have defined the spherical harmonics to be normalized to 1. This implies the normalization of the radial function as indicated in the red box. Thus a function ur can be defined such that it is normalized in the same way as a one-dimensional wave function. Let's substitute the function r in terms of the new function u back into the radial equation. First we look at the action of the second derivative operator in the red box on u over r. The first derivative is easy to work out. To simplify notations, we have used the prime symbol to denote derivatives. Bringing r square into the bracket. A factor of r in the denominator can be cancelled on both sides of the equation. 
Thus, we have succeeded in converting our radar equation into a one-dimensional Schrodinger's equation. The difference is that the radar coordinate r covers only half of the real line. On top of that, there is an additional modification of the potential v by the centrifugal force associated with the angular momentum of the particle. The combined effects of these is known as the effective potential. The centrifugal potential is repulsive as it goes downhill towards larger radial distance, hence its name. We can also see it this way. Angular momentum for circular motion is just the mass mu times the orbital velocity and the radial distance of the particle. Putting these into the centrifugal term, we find that this is just the kinetic energy associated with the circular motion. However, take note that this intuition only applies in the classical limit, as a quantum mechanical particle does not follow a classical trajectory. Let's see how the new radar function u behaves as r goes to infinity. Assuming that the potential v goes to zero in this limit, we can drop this together with the centrifugal term in the equation and figure out the asymptotic form of u. If it is further assumed that the energy E of the particle is negative, then a positive number kappa square can be defined by the term in the red box. This second order differential equation then has the general solution of the linear combination of two exponential functions, one falling rapidly to zero and the other blowing up as r goes to infinity. In order for u to satisfy the normalization condition, we must select the exponentially decreasing solution. Only solutions with the asymptotic form in the green box is normalizable. These are known as bound states, which is the topic of this lecture. They represent states of a particle that are localized around the center of the potential and have negative energies. Let's study the case which is relevant to the hydrogen atom, where V is given by the Coulomb potential. The particle we are talking about will be an electron bound to the nucleus of an atom. The source of the potential will be the positive charges of the nucleus, which is assumed to be static due to its much larger mass relative to the electron. Thus, the nucleus would not be treated quantum mechanically and could be represented just by the potential. We are considering the more general case where there may be more than one unit of electric charge in the nucleus. This is indicated by the integer z, which is the familiar atomic number. Z will be equal to 1 for the hydrogen nucleus and 2 for helium. Note that the Coulomb potential is just a type that goes to zero in this way as it approaches the origin. This is a necessary condition for the radar wave function to be well behaved and non-singular around this region. For more discussion about this claim, refer to lecture 10. It would be convenient to now rewrite this equation by replacing the radar coordinate r with a dimensionless variable, rho. This is motivated by the asymptotic form of u derived earlier. Let's get rid of the prefactor of the second derivative. Multiply both sides of the equation by 2 mu over h bar square. Then divide by kappa square. 
Notice that all R's are now paired with a kappa in the operator within the curly braces. So u is in fact a function of kappa R, which is rho. To simplify matters, we denote the factor in the red box by the parameter xi. Note that both xi and the variable rho are dimensionless, so is the operator in the curly braces. Dimensionless variables are useful when we want to talk about sizes of objects in an unambiguous way. For example, we would specify a small radar distance by this condition, and a large one by this. Let's now solve this equation. We start with the following try solution. The first term captures the behavior of u as r approaches 0. This comes from how the radar function goes as r to the power of l in this limit. Again, we have established this in lecture 10. This must hold for the radar function of any angular momentum state with the quantum number l. Since the function capital R has one power of R less than U, this will suggest the power L plus 1 in the trial solution. The second term simply captures the exponentially decreasing behavior towards large R of bound states. The last term F is an indeterminate function to be solved. This characterizes the behavior for intermediate R. Let's substitute this into the radar equation. In order to better compare the second derivative term with u, it would be convenient to write this as u multiplied by some correction factor. Because there are derivatives involved, the curly braces must contain not only f, but also the first and second derivatives. So we are aiming to write the second derivative in the red box in this form. The first derivative can be evaluated like so. By the product rule, we have a term in which only f is differentiated, and another term in which f is not differentiated. This is the derivative of the first term, which is a power, and we simply bring down the power l plus 1. But in order to bring rho l plus 1 outside the bracket, we need to include a factor of rho in the denominator. The next term is the derivative of the exponential, and just gives minus 1. Let's move on to the second derivative. Once again, we need to keep this in the standard form, applying the product rule once more. We will again have a term that comes from differentiating the two prefactors. These curly braces contain the terms in the red box above. Let's first hide these terms inside the three dots to keep things compact. The next term would correspond to differentiating the terms within the curly braces above. Expanding out the three dots. Recall that this is just a factor that results from differentiating the two leading terms outside, multiplied by the curly braces at the top. F prime can be absorbed into an identical term in the red box. Expanding out the terms in the red box. These two terms can be combined together.
the term in a red box can then be factored. We can now substitute the above result and those in the green box back into the radial equation in the yellow box. We notice some cancellations. We can drop the factor outside the curly braces. And we now have the radial equation for the function f. Let's try a power series solution. The coefficients a's will be the unknowns to be solved. We know this is possible because the Coulomb potential satisfies the condition which allows the solution to be regular near the origin. Let's calculate the first and second derivatives of the series to be used in the Radal equation. Note that we have shifted the summation index S for both series of the derivatives such that each power of rho can be easily compared among all the series. Looking at the radial equation in the yellow box, it will make things easier if we multiply the equation by rho such that all powers of rho will be in the numerator. The first term involves the second derivative and just adds one power of rho to every term in the last series. We absorb the extra power by shifting the summation index by 1 and letting the sum begins with 1. Next is the term involving the first derivative. And we do the same shift in index as well. Combining the two results at the top, we can evaluate the expression in the red box. The last term comes from the s equals to zero term above. We can write f rho in a form that compares better with the previous two expressions. The sum of all three terms in the red boxes would thus give the left hand side of the equation in the yellow box. Let's first consider the terms with zeroth power of rho. These are the sum of the two red boxes. 
They must sum to zero. Similarly, the coefficients of every powers of rho must sum independently to zero. Let's look at these two terms first. They are the ones with the coefficients a s plus 1. s plus 1 can be factored out. Now we include the remaining two terms associated with a s. This equation must be satisfied by the coefficients a's, such that the series f is the solution to the radial equation in the yellow box. Setting s equals to zero simply gives us the equation derived earlier for the zeroth power of rho. This is a recursive equation that allows us to relate the coefficient a to the next one of higher index. In this way, all the coefficients in the power series of f can be derived from the first, a0. Let me remind you what xi is. It's just a different parameter to describe energy. Because the function u is related to the radial function, which behaves like r to the power of l as r goes to zero. By the relation between u and f, this means f approaches a constant in this limit. This is just a0, which must be non zero. Thus, it is possible to generate all the coefficients from a0. We shall continue with this program in the next lecture.